Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Ahead of the Curve, a speaker series from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. My name is Du Bois Bowman. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health. The Ahead of the Curve speaker series focuses on conversations about leadership. And throughout this series, we have discussions with contemporary public health leaders that span many sectors, and we probe them to hear about their insights, uh, their vision, and their stories of perseverance. Leadership is a critical component of navigating complex public health challenges and building a better future through improved health and equity. And so we want to hear about those important factors that shape great leaders, and we want to uh, hear and learn how they continue to grow and evolve so that we can think about and be intentional about training the next generation of leaders. We have a fantastic guest with us today uh, to explore these issues. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Larry Brilliant, who's a physician and epidemiologist with a tremendous career in, in, in public health. He currently serves as CEO of Pan Defense Advisory, a senior counselor at the Skoll Foundation, and a CNN medical analyst. Previously, he was chair of the advisory board of the NGO Ending Pandemics and the founding executive director of Google.org. Uh, proudly for us uh, here at the University of Michigan, earlier in his career, Dr. Brilliant was an associate professor of epidemiology and international health planning at the University of Michigan. Dr. Brilliant lived in India for nearly a decade, where he was a key member of the successful World Health Organization Smallpox Eradication Program for Southeast Asia, as well as the World Health Organization Polio Eradication Program. In terms of his education, he uh, uh, had, of course, medical training, but then he also received his Master of Public Health right here at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. And all of this is just really a small snapshot of his uh, really impressive, uh, tremendous uh, career. And so I'm really excited about our conversation. And I wanna thank those of you who submitted questions in advance during the registration. And we've used those questions to help guide many aspects of our, of, of our conversation uh, today. So Larry, if you're ready, uh, I'm ready to, to, to dive in. I'm ready. I'm very happy to be with you, Du Bois. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Terrific, for terrific. So, you know, given your remarkable career, one that, uh, you know, to me, one of the remarkable things is the, the many different ways, facets of your career, the many different ways that you've had a positive impact on public health and, and, and equity. Can you start just by telling us about your medical training and then eventually what sparked your interest in public health? So um, <clears throat> I was in Ann Arbor. Um, I was pursuing a, my undergraduate degree in philosophy. And uh, I think it was March, um, February, it was Valentine's Day, my father died. And I was very uh, disheartened. And uh, I think I locked myself up in my room at, uh, at South Quad and didn't go out for a long time. And I didn't get my applications in uh, for medical school or law school until it was very late. Uh, and finally, when I did get them in, um, I was disqualified because of that. But uh, one day I went and I was just driving a, a motorcycle <clears throat> in Detroit and I passed by this building and it said Wayne Medical School. And I just pulled up, took my helmet off, walked in and asked to see the Dean of Admissions. And I did. And of course he laughed at me. I said, can I still get in? By then it was August, I think. And he said, well, did you take the MCATs? And I said, no, I didn't. And he walked out and he went to talk to somebody, came back in and said, would you take them now? I said, sure. I didn't tell him. I just come from the dentist and they pulled four wisdom teeth. And, and I took them and then he said, look, I've never done this before, but uh, we have had a dropout. Um, if you promise to graduate and you promise to work and not ask me for, foreign, uh, for uh, student assistance, we'll let you in. So I, I, I was let in without a bachelor's degree. And as I told you earlier, I still don't have my bachelor's degree. And I'd love it if Ann Arbor would change their mind. <laughs> <laughs> terrific. Terrific. And, and then, you know, what drove you then later um, uh, in the 1970s to pursue your Master of Public Health? And, and how do you feel that the public health training, perhaps the combined training uh, in medicine and, and public health, 
have really served you throughout your, your career? Um, so my wife and I came back from uh, India after we had eradicated smallpox and uh, all, all the people who had worked on the smallpox program went back to their universities or to their government uh, affiliations. And so we came back, we were going to come to Ann Arbor and we thought we'd stop at Columbia and uh, we got the idea of taking uh, both an MBA and, a, and an MPH at Columbia. And th then they told me how much it would cost. <laughs> I've been living in India for 10 years. There was no before that. So I wrote Myron Wegman, who had been the head of the WHO regional office in, called PAHO. And I said I was going to come visit Ann Arbor. And he said, well, we can make you a, you know, a Michigan resident because you were away on good things. Yep. Uh, and then it, ultimately he gave me a, a full scholarship so I could come to Ann Arbor. It was really wonderful. And I had a great time. And Ken Warner uh, would teach me uh, uh, economics and I would try to teach him epidemiology and Bob Gross uh, would try to teach us all, you know, population planning. And, um, and of course, Arno Monto was my, my mentor. I, I love that guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's always interesting as I hear stories, um, just some of the serendipity involved. And, you know, we're certainly fortunate and grateful that, that, uh, that, that some of that serendipity in your pathway, you know, brought you to the University of Michigan and to the School of Public Health. So, so um, I want to ask an, another question. So next week here on the University of Michigan campus, um, we'll be uh, celebrating the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who you know, continues to serve as an inspiration to all of us for his his life's work to to advance equity. And, you know, uh, little known to some, uh, much of his work specifically drew attention to health. And uh, you're uh, aware of his his quote that exemplifies this that he made in, in 1966. It says, you know, of all forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhumane. And uh, Larry, you published a, a book a few years ago called Sometimes Brilliant, where you talk about many different experiences that you've had throughout your life. And some of those we'll, we'll touch on today. But I want to ask you about one in particular. You wrote about meeting Dr. King right here on the University of Michigan campus when he visited. And so I wanted to just ask you to tell us about that experience, what it was like, and, and then ultimately how, uh, how that experience impacted you and in, in, in your journey. Well, I think it was all about a, a winter storm in Ann Arbor. Um, there was a little note in the Michigan Daily that Dr. King was going to be on campus and speak at um, either Rackham, I think it was Hill. Uh, and um, so I thought I would go. I, I don't think I'd been out anywhere, uh, but I did go. And the weather was just god awful. You know, in Ann Arbor, uh, as the poet said, sometimes the rain can can flow horizontally, not just vertically. <laughs> uh, and it, kids were not going in. And uh, we wound up going in to see Dr. King in a cavernous hall that would hold 3,000. And there weren't more than 50 people there. Wow. And uh, Harlan Hatcher, who was the president, was really embarrassed when he you know, introduced Dr. King to an empty room. And um, Dr. King got up and started laughing and laughing and laughing. And he said, look, there'll be more of me to go around. You all come on up here on stage with me. <laughs> and we all went on the, you know, that parquet floor and we sat around. And I'd never hear I'd never heard anybody speak like he did. He, he spoke about a conviction and a commitment to a better world. And it wasn't just that there might be a better world. It might be that it would be done by much struggle but that there was room in that struggle for everybody, everybody who was sitting around him, everybody in an arbor. Uh, and then he famously said that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. You've all heard that. Yes. But what he said in an arbor was a little bit different. He said, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, but it ain't going to bend towards justice on its own. You got to get off your ass <laughs> and jump out of your chair and leap up and grab that arc and bend it and twist it towards justice. Yeah. And he had me and he had all of us. Every single person who was on that stage went down to Birmingham that summer or marched with him. Um, I'm proud to say that the only time I've ever been arrested was with Dr. King <laughs> in a march in uh, Chicago. Um, 
we were, he was marching in support of, I think, the cleaning union. Um, and we in medical school were wearing our white coats and ostensibly dangling our stethoscope to protect him in some crazy way. But we were all arrested. What they didn't realize that they'd also arrested uh, Peter, Paul and Mary. And they sang for us. And then they didn't realize that they had Joan Baez, who sang Amazing Grace. And Dr. King sang Amazing Grace. And that was it. I mean, you know, my, my brain was cooked and I was all in. Yeah. Yeah. What an amazing man. Absolutely. Absolutely. A remarkable story. And, you know, even as you reflect on his words and thinking how relevant those words are uh, for, for, for today. So, um, you know, very, very inspiring. Yeah. So, so let's now, now shift to, you know, the, maybe the first part of the, uh, you know, uh, beginning part of your career long work in, in, in public health. And so I want to first start by talking about your work in smallpox. Uh, for members of the audience today who were not yet alive during this time to directly witness the impact of, of smallpox, I uh, thought I'd ask you to just first by uh, uh, start by describing and painting a picture of the devastation and the, the daunting outlook for the world regarding smallpox, and then talk about what made you decide to dedicate yourself to eradicating the disease. I think it's you know, it's hard to, to tell what virus in history is the worst in history, but certainly smallpox is a contender for that terrible title. In the 20th century alone, which actually was from 1900 to 1980, because we eradicated it and uh, WHO declared it eradicated in 1980. During those 80 years, half a billion people died of smallpox. It's not a word -o. 500 million people died of smallpox, and they were mostly little kids. And all over the world, people didn't name their children until the 40th or 50th day because they didn't know if they would survive smallpox. And in much of the world, smallpox wasn't even thought of as a regular disease because it was always there, ubiquitous. And in India particularly, it was a very... It's, it's, it's so devastating that I can only describe it by two vignettes when once when I would go to uh, this town called Tatanagar, which was the worst exporter of smallpox in history in India. And I drove up and I had a WHO Jeep. So I had the UN seal on it. Mm -hmm. And I walked out of the Jeep and a woman came running up to me and said, you're a United Nations doctor, please heal my child. And she handed me her child. It was filled with smallpox lesions all over his face. His eyes were closed and I, you know, it was just involuntarily, you have to hold your hands out and hold that baby. And that child had already died. Wow. And there's nothing I could do. And so you, you get the, you understand what it was like for parents to lose their kids to this horrible disease. And when I made my way into the railway station, which was where the exportations of smallpox had occurred from, I saw bodies of babies wrapped in cloth, piled high like cords of of wood. It was devastating. And we don't see anything comparable. The r naught or the index of spread of smallpox is between three and five, which is a lot compared to most viral diseases, but it's not as infectious as Omicron is today or, um, you know, XBB 1.5, but it killed one out of three, wow. not one out of a thousand. And there was no cure for it. There was no palliative for it. So children would lie. I mean, it just, it was, it's a horrible disease. And I'm, I'm so happy that most of the people here were not born when it still was in existence and never had to experience it. Yeah. I will tell you one interesting knock on effect, which is because it was so bad, the world came together and agreed that there'd be universal. Uh, vaccination of every child born in the world. And all countries subscribed to that. There was hardly any exception to that. So we had a huge number of people in the world that were immune to smallpox. Mm -hmm. But in 1980, when we declared it eradicated, naturally, country after country dropped the mandate to eradicate, to, to vaccinate kids. And what that did for monkeypox was that during the smallpox program, there were only a couple dozen cases a year. Thereafter, Gradually, more and more people got monkeypox, uh, but about 3,000 a year until only last year. 
Now, why was that? Because the smallpox vaccine protects against monkeypox as well. Yeah. And so it wasn't the eradication of smallpox that caused the surge of monkeypox, but it was the elimination of the vaccine mandate that did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, what, what uh, sobering reflections and, and stories, and I'm sure in, in a way that just kind of anchored um, a sense of purpose in, in, in your work uh, that, that led you throughout that, that period of time. And um, in, in terms of a, a public health framework or approach or strategy, you know, what, what if, can you briefly describe what your approach was to eliminating smallpox at that time? So forever, um, going all the way back to <clears throat> the Middle Ages, as soon as we had a vaccine, even before we had a vaccine, we had virulation, a process of taking uh, the, the scabs of a child with smallpox and pulverizing them, and then taking that powder and blowing it, uh, sometimes with an ostrich legs bone, blowing it into somebody's nose. Wow. And that process, which occurred in Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, China, and probably in some parts of Latin America, was called variolation. Variola is the name for, for smallpox. Mm -hmm. um, it, it provided immunity, but it killed one out of 10. Mm -hmm. So what you're, you're trading the risk for a high death rate, and it was unacceptable until Jenner discovered uh, that uh, cowpox would give lifelong protection against smallpox. And he discovered that because he had been told that uh, the reason that we say that a, a milkmaid, we used to say in the ancient days, a milkmaid had a beautiful complexion wasn't because of drinking milk, as people thought, because milkmaids were the only people in British society who never had smallpox. Why did this one group of women, this one profession, alone, uniquely not get smallpox? And it was because in milking a cow, Sometimes a lesion would pass from the udder of a cow to the milkmaid's fingers, and that was enough to protect them for life against smallpox. Jenner observed that, and he concluded that if he could take that pus, either from the udder of the cow or the finger of a milkmaid, and he chose a milkmaid named Sarah Nelm and a cow named Blossom, and this is all part of the history that I'm sure you teach public health, um, that he could transfer that to a young boy Daniel Phelps, and he did, and that boy was the first boy who was protected against smallpox by cowpox. And the Latin name for cow is vacus, and so that process became known as vaccination. Mm -hmm. So when you encounter the anti-vax community, you might just tell them that uh, vaccination means cows, so they're just against cows. That's all it means. <laughs> Uh, terrific, terrific. So uh, you worked with uh, Dr. William Fagy, Bill Fagy, on a project called Becoming Better Ancestors. Uh, and this is a series of videos uh, featuring public health leaders discussing nine lessons learned from your work to eradicate smallpox. So, you know, some of those lessons are, you know, you're articulating now thus far in our, in our conversation. Um, <clears throat> you were featured in Lesson seven uh, of, of the nine, which is seek strong leadership and management. Can you tell us more just about the, the leaders who you worked with to eradicate smallpox and what you feel you learned from them? Well, let's start with Bill. Um, so Bill Fagy, uh, for those who you don't know, uh, who don't know him, uh, Bill was the head of CDC. He was the head of the Carter Center, and he's the guy who whispered in Bill Gates's ear, I think you ought to start it foundation that deals with global health. He was and is the most charismatic person I have met in the field of public health. And it was Bill who found the strategy that worked to eradicate smallpox. Earlier, I said that country after country vaccinated everybody through a mandate. Yet that didn't work to eradicate smallpox. In India, even if they had followed that completely and mandated everybody to be vaccinated. Every year there were 25 million babies born. And of course they didn't really vaccinate everybody. And that number of susceptibles was sufficient to keep smallpox propagating. Instead of vaccinating everybody or trying to, or lying about it or pretending that we did, 
Bill had an experience. Bill was a, is a very devout Christian. His father was a Lutheran minister, his grandfather a Lutheran minister. And he was working as a uh, uh, medical uh, director of a church uh, hospital in uh, Nigeria during the Igbo Civil War. And Bill was allotted a small amount of smallpox vaccine. And there was a terrific outbreak. And he knew that he didn't have enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody. Now, in the real world, a small amount of vaccine in the face of a deadly disease would go either to the person who came and clamored for it or the brother or sister of the prime minister. But Bill said, what is my moral duty? And he said his moral duty was to allocate the vaccine first and foremost to those most vulnerable of contracting the disease. And who were they? They were the people who lived in the same household or were neighbors of a case of smallpox. So he did that and smallpox disappeared and only in his hospital area. And he came to believe that selective epidemiological control, which this was, later named ring vaccination, was the key to eradicating smallpox. And he published a seminal article in the Journal of Epidemiology in 1969, 1970, um, which allowed WHO and the and DA Henderson, the wonderful leader of the smallpox program in Geneva, to change course and instead of vaccinating everyone to first find every single case of smallpox in India, in Bangladesh, in the four countries that remain with smallpox, Pakistan and Nepal. Of course, to do that, we had to go house to house. We had to have reward posters. We had to go to marketplaces and all throughout India, our team of 150,000 people made 2 billion house calls. And it, 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 when you're worried about whether a doctor is going to come make a house call in Ann Arbor, you know, we, two billion of them. And we found every case of smallpox and uh, vaccinated a ring of immunity around it. And that was the strategy that led to the eradication of smallpox. By the way, that's the same strategy that has been successful. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Ebola outbreak in um, Uganda has just been declared over. Same strategy. Uh, also in Congo. Same strategy. Um, we've tried using that search and containment, surveillance and containment, ring vaccination approach. We tried using it during COVID. But as you know, we really couldn't get many people to cooperate with contact tracing in the United States. So, um, but it's the same principle. Yep. Find every case, find the most vulnerable, allocate your resources in an equitable fashion. Yep. And equity turns out to be the best epidemiology. Absolutely. And, and do you remember a particular moment um, when you felt like there was a moment of a victory, if you will, you know, when you when, when the last case of smallpox was uh, uh, eliminated and you knew that the, the disease was actually eradicated or did it did it actually unfold more so in, in, in phases? What was what was your recollection? Well, you know, it wouldn't have been any fun if you hadn't had three or four moments that you thought you had victory right. and, you had lost and you had to start over again, <laughs> which is, of course, what happened to, to us. Um, what I remember the most dramatically <clears throat> was on August 15th, 1975, <clears throat> when we thought we'd had the last case of smallpox in India, and Bangladesh thought that they had had the last case, which would mean no more variola major. That's the deadly variant that killed one out of three. Variolum minor, also known as a lastrum, that was a uh, less dangerous disease, but it was still in Somalia and it still would have to be eradicated. But we were sure that we had eradicated smallpox. We'd gone six weeks without a case. We had a great surveillance system. So DA Henderson, who later became the Dean of Johns Hopkins, DA was in Geneva he flew in, Hofton Mahler, who was the director general of WHO, flew in, Mrs. Gandhi came, and we were about to do the first global television broadcast ever done. We all went to the television studio, of uh, New Delhi Television. And while we were there, waiting for the camera to go on uh, Mrs. Gandhi, we got a telegram that um, Sheikh Mujib Rahman, who was the prime minister of Bangladesh, had been killed. Wow. And with his assassination, millions of people were fleeing as refugees from Bangladesh 
and some of them were carrying smallpox wow. and they reintroduced smallpox back into India. So we stopped the, the broadcast. Mrs. Gandhi was extremely angry. Dr. Mahler was not so happy having made the trip to India <laughs> and we had to start all over again. And um, that's the, you know, I think that success is only sweeter when you've had so many, you know, roadblocks. This was a big roadblock. Absolutely. But, but the last case of smallpox, the last case of variola major. Now, there's a lot of last cases. Yep. There's the last case of variola major in nature. Then there's the last case of variola major from a lab accident. There's the last case of elastrum or variola minor. But the one that matters the most to me was the last case of variola major in nature because that's the one that stretches all the way back to Pharaoh Ramses V, an unbroken chain of transmission over those thousands of years. Wow. And that was a little girl named Rahima Banu. And she lived in a village called Karalia on Bola Island in Bangladesh. And when we had finished eradicating smallpox in India and Nepal and Pakistan, and Bangladesh alone uh, was infected, we got a call. I was working at the uh, regional office called CIRO, the Southeast Asia Regional Office. And we got a call that they thought that they had found the last case. And there was a lot of, I don't know, wariness because we'd done that before. <laughs> so I was asked to go uh, and lead a, a team to do a search of 30 miles radius around that case and see if we could find more. We didn't find any more cases. And I was face to face with this little girl who was the last case of smallpox in my world. And, um, and I, I thought that, you know, as her scabs had fallen on the ground and the virus was killed by the sun and she had breathed out the last virus, she recovered. But as those viruses died, that was the end of history. That was the end of all the stories about smallpox and yeah. all the number of billions of people perhaps who had been killed by it. Yeah. Um, I just cried like a baby. Yeah. That was, yeah, that, that's when public health is good. Absolutely. 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 Remarkable feat and, and accomplishment. And one that, at, you know, as this conversation has illustrated, still carries many um, lessons for us to, to, to think about future threats. And, you know, so, so it was, now I actually move to a related topic building on that remark that one of the wonderful things that you did recently was to donate your uh, World Health Organization India Smallpox Campaign Archive to the University of Michigan's Bentley Historical Library. And so this includes tens of thousands of documents and photos and microfilms and CDs documenting uh, the work of the of, of the team. And so, you know, I, I'd like to ask you what made you decide to make this generous donation uh, to the University of Michigan? And then how do you hope that this rich resource is utilized? Well, it's a very unique archive. Um, when I was teaching in an arbor, uh, D.A. Henderson <clears throat> asked me to go back to New Delhi and turn off the lights on the program. After we had found the last case, there was an obligatory two-year period of observation to be sure there were no more cases. That had expired. WHO had now declared smallpox eradicated, but the program, the office had not been closed down. So I went from Ann Arbor back to New Delhi and I closed down the office. <clears throat> and in doing that, I asked to see all of the files um, and uh, WHO brought all the files up and I said, well, what are you going to do with them? And they said, well, we're going to burn them. Oh, wow. So I called DA uh, and he said, oh, make a microfilm before they're burned. And so I tried to get the microfilming done in India, but the paper that, uh, you know, WHO files in those days, especially the carbon copies were on such paper, it couldn't go through these machines that they used in India. Uh, so I said to DA, uh, shall I bring them to Geneva? And I did. We couldn't find any place in Geneva that could handle such delicate paper, but there was a place in Ann Arbor. And that place was called, um, it became Xerox, it was called um, uh, Microfilm, a University Microfilm in Ann Arbor, it was then bought by Xerox. So I asked them if they could fill, if they could, you know, make these into microfilm. They said yes, and on top of that, we won't charge you because we know how historically important this wow. is. So I took one set of the microfilm and I sent it to the WHO library. I gave one set to DA Henderson, and I kept one set. And then I said to DA, 
what should I do with the originals? And there are hundreds of thousands of pages and photos and records. And DA said, well, call up the library in WHO and offer them that. So I did. And they said, no, we don't want that. We don't have any space. To so over the next 40 years, every few years, I would call up WHO and I would say, what do you want me to do with this library? And every time they would say, oh, we, we've got the microfilm. That's good enough. When I was at Google, I was able to get a complete set of, I digitized the entire okay. library. Okay. And I thought that was enough. So I said to WHO, will you take the originals? They said, no. I called the A and he said, do whatever you want to do with it. So I kept it with me for another 30 years. And I moved it every time I moved. I took them with it. It, it fills up an entire room. <laughs> and, uh, and then I was talking uh, to the folks in Ann Arbor and I said, that's the right place for it. That's where the microfilms were made. That's where I was a professor. That's where I really learned epidemiology. Um, so I'm really happy that they're there. And I have to, just a word, uh, the Bentley is a treasure. Absolutely. And the people there are just wonderful people. So I hope that everybody who is interested will be able to see whatever you want. There's a lot of great photos and a great movie. The only movie that I know of that has actual pictures of Wow. People with smallpox and the eradicators. It was a Japanese movie. Yeah, and thanks and thanks to you for having the foresight to you know, to really uh, work hard to preserve those originals and ensure that uh, they ultimately found a, a home uh, where they'll, they'll they'll benefit generations to come. So uh, you know your work in um, smallpox was, of course, not the end of the road. Um, that you, you closed one chapter. Uh, declared victory, uh, but you knew there'd be work ahead. And so I'd like to now ask you uh, just about your experience uh, working uh, in the World Health Organization's effort to eradicate polio. Uh, how'd you get involved in that work? And then what lessons learned from small from the smallpox campaign were you able to actually apply to address polio? And then what, you know, the the other side of the question is, you know, were there specific things that, that, that you had to do, do or go about differently? So um, the tsunami, the, the Christmas day or the, the Boxing Day uh, uh, tsunami um, in 2004, I think it was, um, when that occurred, I immediately got on a plane and I, I went to volunteer to work in the refugee camps. There were so many refugees that it, I saw the pictures of this train in Hikadua in Sri Lanka that it turned over. And Indonesia had so many people um, who had hurt and hurt. So I started working in the refugee camps. And um, after I had worked for several months in the refugee camps and it was time for me to come home, I came back through New Delhi and I visited the WHO uh, offices and David Heyman was visiting there from Geneva. He was the head of the polio program. Uh, and he said, look, uh, we've had a, a tragedy. And the person who was running the program in uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh uh, had to leave. We don't have anybody running the program there. Would you do that for six months? So I stayed for six months. And uh, we reorganized the, the program around similar lines. We started focusing more on surveillance now, it's not so easy with polio. With smallpox, 100% of the people have scars or lesions, and it's very visible. Polio, only one out of 1,000 people that are infected have any symptoms at all. And those symptoms are very slow to be appreciated because they're paresis and then paralysis. Yep. So surveillance had a very different meaning. We established a proxy for surveillance uh, which is called acute flaccid paralysis, AFP. And we began looking house to house again, looking for every case of a child who had any kind of paralysis, whatever the cause, even if it was transient. And we developed a benchmark and we looked at places that had a higher uh, incidence than that benchmark. We also used sewage sampling for the very first time and looked at the genomics of the virus that we found. So we still had a surveillance led vaccination program instead of just vaccinating everybody. Uh, I don't think people know that what slows down the polio eradication program in Pakistan is that these poor little kids don't have much of an immune system. They usually have two or three other enteroviruses. 
competing for their immune system's attention. And in order to give them immunity against polio, sometimes they get vaccinated not once, not twice, but 20 times. And so the parents get really mad. They say, why are you Westerners only coming to my house just for this one disease? I have a lot of other problems. And it, 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 it's, it, you know, it's a legitimate, certainly it's a legitimate concern. Um, but that I was really happy to be able to see the last cases of polio in India. Uh, there's still a handful of cases in Pakistan, but just as all the little articles you see the, about polio were this close, we're really, we're still this, still this close. And it's worth it. Absolutely. And, and so another facet of your very remarkable career is that, um, uh, you know, following your work uh, on uh, smallpox, um, you know, many people in, involved in that program, including you and your wife, came together to create the SABA Foundation, uh, which, of course, works to provide critical eye care and to restore sight for, for people across the, the globe. And so you know, you've said at the time when you started doing that, that work and when you started the foundation in the late 1970s, that blindness was thought of, of as a clinical disease, not a public health issue. Can you tell us you know, why you decided to, to tackle this problem and to do so as a, as a public health problem? Um, so full disclosure, I was a hippie. And I first came to India uh, with a caravan of psychedelic painted buses, and I lived in an ashram for three years. Uh, and uh, it was my teacher in the ashram who told me that I had to go work for WHO and help eradicate smallpox. But after smallpox was eradicated, some of the Russian epidemiologists, American epidemiologists, WHO workers from all over the world wanted to do something like that again. Um, and my wife and I had written an article about uh, how smallpox was eradicated. And I had done a book by then called, that Ann Arbor Press published, University of Michigan Press published. And when the article came out, people sent me money, cash in envelopes. <laughs> and I knew I wasn't supposed to buy a Mercedes with that. So uh, I started the SAVA Foundation and I brought all the people together. But I didn't want to just bring WHO people. I didn't want to just bring CDC people that had PhDs in epidemiology. I wanted to bring people who had a heart connection to doing work in the field for people who were less privileged and maybe had a political conviction of working with lesser developed countries. So the people I brought together for the board meeting were very eclectic. They didn't look exactly the same as the folks in the smallpox program, although Bill Fagey was there, but I had Steve Jobs there and I had Wavy Gravy there and I had Ram Dass there and I had spiritual people from about 10 different religions, I think maybe more. And we became the Seva Foundation. Um, we also had Jerry Garcia and Bobby Ware from the Grateful Dead. And over the next 30 years, we've had over 150 concerts, benefit concerts, many of them by the Grateful Dead or the Jefferson Airplane, Joan Baez, some of them in Ann Arbor, mostly out here on the West Coast, that raised uh, $200 million to fund the blindness work. And uh, I'm really proud that uh, uh, two years ago, before Nick Kristoff uh, took a hiatus from the New York Times, every year he gives an award to the top nonprofit. SAVA got the Nick Kristoff Award wow. Wow. Uh, for being the best nonprofit. And uh, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud that 5 million people can see again and for free uh, because of the money donated by very generous supporters and the work of, you, you met Suzanne Gilbert. Uh, some of your folks met Suzanne Gilbert when she was in Ann Arbor. She, we hired her as our second employee in Ann Arbor and she's still running the blindness program. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a, you know, one notable thing about your career uh, is you've worked in, ways where you could actually see and observe the impact of your efforts. And, you know, that has to feel very, very rewarding. Uh, you know, I mean, thinking about many areas of, of science where, you know, one's advancements and contributions are, are they, they are making an impact, but the bulk of that impact is uh, maybe, maybe many years ahead. So I want to transition now just to, um, uh, you know, bringing us to really to the present to address uh, COVID. And, you obviously have a tremendous amount of expertise around pandemic 
response and disease eradication. And, you know, for many years before the COVID-19 pandemic, you were talking about strategies that we can and should use to, pre to prevent the next threat. And it's because you understood that the question wasn't really about will the next pandemic pr prone outbreak happen, but it was more of a matter of when. And so, you know, as you look back now, um, perhaps some of the things that you could anticipate uh, as you, you know, were ahead of the curve, if you will, you know, what are some of the things that you, you think we did right uh, when it came to our COVID-19 response? Uh, what are some things, what are some areas that, that reflect shortcomings or areas that we went wrong? You know, one, one always wants to see the best. Um, but I would say that our response to COVID was uh, shameful. Um, I think there's hardly any country in the world that could take great pride in the response that they had to COVID. Some countries prior to there being vaccines did extremely well. They were mostly the countries of Southeast Asia, Thailand, and particularly Cambodia, um, Vietnam, Taiwan, and then New Zealand. A lot of the island countries run by women did very, very well, I have to say. But once there was a vaccine, and we can talk just for a moment about uh, Operation Warp Speed. Once there was a vaccine, the U.S. gobbled up a disproportionate amount of the vaccine doses. Um, the Western world, the wealthy world, put advanced purchase agreements in place, locking up the supply. So countries like, and I'll focus for a second on South Africa, Countries like South Africa didn't get any vaccine. And those things that were helpful to prevent the spread of COVID prior didn't work very well once the virus began to mutate to become more transmissible. And I, to this day, think that the failure of country, companies like Moderna to allow proximate manufacture of the vaccine in Africa has was one of the factors that has led to the creation of new variants, certainly Omicron yeah. with all of its um, mutations. So I think that we have to be really careful. Um, I think the Trump administration did awful uh, there. There was one moment when a, a cruise ship with 2000 people on it, hundreds of Americans with COVID was coming in to get those people medical care. And Trump said, I don't want that boat docking on American port because then those numbers will count against me. And I, I still think that is the most shameful act of a president in history, that, that it was all about those numbers. So, uh, but, I, but I don't think the Biden administration's rollout has been stellar. I think Andy Slavitt did a great job in the rollout, um, but the disinformation, misinformation, missteps of my beloved CDC, where I trained as well, um, I did my, my my residency in preventive medicine at Michigan and CDC, um, but CDC has been a big disappointment. So I'm I, I don't think there's a, I think there's a lot of credit that goes to the individual workers in the field, the county health officers, state health workers, but I think at a national level, you know, when the the final reports are made, we could have done so much better. We missed so many opportunities. And so that's that's something that brings me great sadness. I don't like to say that, you know, publicly because the, the, the field of public health is already becoming downtrodden. We've taken all the flack uh, and there's a lot of anger, misunderstanding of public health. I think we in public health did really well, but the politicians did terrible. Yeah. And it, it's not just Republican or Democrat, right wing or left wing, almost all of them did terrible. Yeah, so so I, I want to build on the thread that, that you included in your remarks um, in asking about public health communications, and you engage extensively in communications work in your role as a CNN medical analyst, and you write articles for a number of different news sources. You're on social media uh, a lot. Why is the area of of communications important to the field of public health, and and why do you dedicate a lot of your time uh, to uh, in this space of communications? Well, this brings us back to Bill Fagey and these nine lessons from smallpox eradication. The number one lesson is that with 
public trust, public health can do anything. Yep. Without public trust, public health can't do almost anything. Yep. And we squandered public health trust. Um, politician after politician uh, failed to allow transparency and honest communications, alternative facts in, in the United States. But it was everywhere. It wasn't just here. Um, Modi's India, Bolsonaro's Brazil. Uh, it, there were very few countries that maintained open, honest, transparent communications. If you don't tell the truth, it may be a short term winning strategy, but long term, it's a terrible strategy. It's, it's morally corrosive and it, you bankrupt the, the bank in which trust is stored. And once it's gone, it's very difficult to restore it. And that's one of the lessons from smallpox eradication. Radical transparency, honest numbers, full reporting, and especially the mistakes that you make. Yeah. Say them first. Yeah. <laughs> Be honest about them um, and humility. Absolutely. And, and so now we're entering a new phase of the pandemic where we're, you know, we're learning to coexist with COVID. Uh, but as we're experiencing now, uh, we will face formidable new variants. Uh, and as we look toward the future, there will also undoubtedly be other disease threats that, that, that we'll face in the future. What should, you know, keeping all of the, your remarks in mind about how we handled uh, the emergence of, of, um, of COVID, what should we be thinking about in terms of pandemic preparedness now for the future? So I have an article in the current issue of Foreign Affairs uh, trying to analyze what the next big one might be. M more to say, these are things you don't have to worry about. They're not going to be a, a big pandemic compared to what we have now. And, and mostly respiratory diseases, with short incubation periods and high, and high reproduction numbers, which really takes you down to coronaviruses and influenza viruses. But it may very well be that the next pandemic is not another virus, but is actually just SARS-CoV-2. So we, we now have over 500 variants and subvariants of this disease. It may be just because we have genomics now and we're looking for it that we know that maybe other viruses RNA viruses have, have had that many variants. It's hard to believe that that's the case, however. So 500 subvariants means either one of two things. One, this would be good. Uh, and Arnomanto is the, the king of uh, uh, corona cold viruses. We have four of them. Half of all the colds that you get are coronaviruses. And they look enough like COVID to make you imagine that perhaps 500 years ago, there was another COVID pandemic and that these old coronavirus pandemics have now retired into the retirement home called, they became a cold. Right. right. And it may be that having 500 subvariants is a signal that this one's running out of gas and that there are very few more mutations left to be had on the spike, for example. It may not be though. Uh, I have some very good friends who are uh, evolutionary virologists. They're certain that this is the end, the swan song, the denouement of COVID. I pray that they are right. <laughs> but, but, but I'm a, I'm a, a, a mathematical wonk, you know. Uh, and I look at the 1.4 billion people in China. I look at vaccines that have 20 to 30 percent efficacy. I look at the fact that less than 100 million people have had the disease. There's probably a hundred, probably one billion people in China who are immunologically naive to either the XBB 1.5 that we may be sending to them or to the BA7, which is currently prevalent in China. And I can't imagine what will happen after Chinese New Year's. This will date your the video, but I can't imagine what's going to happen after Chinese New Year's if as many people get COVID as the models show in a shorter period of time. So I, I think it's a low probability that we will get a, a super bad variant out of COVID at this stage, but it's a low probability with a highly consequential event. Right. And I don't think we're paying it enough attention. Right. So I see it. I hear a thread of optimism in, in your remarks and you've spoken about optimism 
uh, in the face of your work? What, what keeps you optimistic as you know, you've confronted challenge after challenge after challenge? Well, I've met Martin Luther King and I've seen the last case of smallpox and I had a guru in the Himalayas who predicted that smallpox would be eradicated. Those were all impossible things for a kid from Detroit, Michigan. So how can I not be optimistic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrific, terrific. So it, it, we've covered a lot today. Um, I think it's evident from this conversation and from what you've written, uh, including in your book, that you know, you've constantly pushed yourself to explore new experiences and to be open-minded and honestly uh, uh, courageous uh, when it comes to, to, to your life and your career. And thinking about our audience, um, that will uh, surely include some students and uh, young professionals. Can you talk more just about the value of that and what you would say to others uh, in, in this regard as they go about the continuing their educational journeys and their careers? So I've had a, another life, of course, uh, in the technology world. I was vice president of Google, and I've run a bunch of tech companies, and I've been around a lot of wealth. Uh, so I've been around a lot of success in that meaning of success and around a lot of success in the world of public health. There's no comparison. You may be wealthier being in business, but yet you won't be happier. The happiest people in the world are the people who've worked for others, sacrificed themselves, worked in public health, often thankless, but they know, we know what you've done. It's the most rewarding field in the world. And if your goal is to be happy and to you know, feel at the end of time that you've done as good a job with this life that you've inherited, you can't go wrong with public health. Absolutely. Absolutely. So well, thank you uh, so much for your remarks. Um, you, your work throughout your career uh, captures and reflects so much history. Uh, there's a part of there, there's another part of history from the University of Michigan that that you see on a daily basis. Um, and if <laughs> the members of the team can put the, this door up, tell us tell us about what we're what we in the audience are seeing right now. So this was the front door of the epidemiological epidemiology department, um, the annex, which is Observatory Lodge, right across the street from the main office. And that's where my my door looked, except at the bottom it it said Department of Epidemiology. And I ran a, a survey of blindness in Nepal. And this is where we, we ran the study from. And we were there for about five years. And um, after I'd left Ann Arbor, and I came back and I gave the commencement speech at the, I think it was at Rackham. And Ken Warner, who was the dean then, and he came in after I'd given my commencement speech and it was very sweet. I got a standing ovation, it was very nice. And he said, Larry, uh, that was nice. Thank you. But we've really decided to show you the door. I said, what do you mean, show me the door? I mean, I, I've, I've left Ann Arbor. No, Larry, we're going to show you the door. And he brought that door on stage and sent it to my house here in California. Um, as a, I mean, it was the most loving thing I'd ever had. And I really, I treasure it. It is the front door to my house. <laughs> So, so as you return home, I hope it serves as a daily reminder that you're always welcome back in the door uh, here at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. So, so, so please do know that. So we're, we're just about now at the end of our time for Ahead of the Curve. And I want to express my sincere thanks and appreciation uh, to you, Dr. Brilliant, for, for taking time to be with us today and for sharing some really great insights and remarkable stories uh, and stories that reflect many lessons for, for leadership. Uh, we will be making a recording of this available in a few places, including on our University of Michigan School of Public Health website. So, so please be on the, the, the lookout for that. And we'll also uh, be making it available as part of our po podcast, which is entitled Population Healthy. I encourage you to check out our podcast and subscribe to it wherever you listen to your to your podcast. And finally, I invite all of you to join us for our next Ahead of the Curve event featuring Dr. Sanjay Gupta, which will take place at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday, February 1st. And so I hope to see you there. But uh, Larry, thank you so much again. 
Uh, I really, I've learned so much in our conversation today. I, I know and trust that members of our audience have as well. And so I just want to, again, reiterate my appreciation and thanks to you for joining us. So be well, uh, stay safe, and always go blue. Go blue. And Du Bois, you know, I've uh, had the privilege of working with and knowing seven deans of the School of Public Health. I hope they know how lucky they are that they have you. Thank really you. appreciate it. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.